Welcome everyone. We'll be getting started in about one minute. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, this is a part four of our six part series, Staying in Conversation About Racism. I'm Kirsi Aulene, I'm the director of the Ombuds Office and um, partnering with me is Donna Mejia, who is an associate professor here at CU Boulder. Um, in order uh, to start, we'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Um, you are in view and listen mode only. We have uh, all the cameras turned off so that we can preserve bandwidth. If you want to communicate with, um, with us and ask us questions, there is a Q&A button in your toolbar. We would like you to open your chat box uh, now. Um, we will ask you to chat us from time to time and it also allows you to see responses from other folks on this webinar and um, learn from their wisdom as well. Uh, our co-host today is Liz Hill. And if you have any questions while Donna and I are presenting, please address them to Liz so that she can help you while we are going through the presentation. We will be having a time for Q&A at the end. Most likely, if you put a question in the Q&A box, it will be handled at the end. Um, and that is a way to ask a question anonymously. Um, we will provide times during the presentation to chat us about certain uh, questions that we ask. Um, OK. Oh, one more thing is that if you've been following Ombuds Office webinars, these uh, staying in conversation about racism webinars are uh, slightly longer by popular demand. We plan on having our content uh, last about 45 minutes uh, with about 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. Once uh, we are finished with the webinar, we will be following up with you with a, uh, an email listing all the resources that are mentioned, as well as a link to a recording of today's webinar. While uh, Don and I are, are presenting, Liz will be posting those in the chat function. However, we are aware that not everyone's computers are set up to be able to capture things from the chat function. So we just don't want you to worry that you will be getting that follow-up email with all of those resources. Okay, would you like to Get us started, Donna. I would. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we are located on the traditional territories of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations. There are 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. I would like to offer a hello and gratitude to my own people, the Mississippi Choctaw, 
and the Alabama Kushata were part of the Trail of Tears. Metakwie uh, Oyasin. We would like to also reiterate every week the same pledge. We will be encouraging and humorous in our offerings. We will explain thoughtfully and clearly. We will offer citation for what we have learned and concede openly what we have not yet learned. We will ensure a welcoming, judgment-free and inviting environment where counterpoint ideas can be exchanged diplomatically. Our discussion will welcome new ideas and perspectives. We will remain receptive to these concepts changing and transforming based on your questions and feedback. Please let us know if you perceive glaring holes in our research. We intend to give you tools to increase your conversancy, expand your boundaries, and nurture independence. We have no interest in telling you what to think, but we are passionate about helping you ask better questions so that you can glean those self-evident truths without interference from socially indoctrinated filters. We will respect your differences and our differences in and out of this experience because your dignity and import, excuse me, your dignity and comfort are important to us. And in return, we ask for your courage, diplomacy, open thinking, and active involvement. We hold ourselves accountable to the same standards and caliber we are requesting of you. Thank you for being here. We always bookend this presentation with this very powerful quote about being a teacher but we would ask you to substitute the word teacher for whatever role you serve in our university community. If you are a staffer, if you are a gardener, if you are a mentor, if you are a medical professional, wherever you are in our university, you have the potential always to help make someone's life miserable or joyous, to be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration, to humiliate or humor, hurt or heal because it is your response that decides whether a situation will be escalated or de-escalated or someone else humanized or dehumanized. We recommend the writings of Haim Jinnon if you'd like to hear more of that kind of wonderful wisdom. Before I hand it over to Kiersey, we wanted to give this gentle reminder about the importance of questioning there's so much we don't know about each other and about each of our individual experiences and about the world around us. We're all in fact finding mode and in research mode at all times. And all the stars that you see are just part of that tiny, tiny, tiny circle of the outer band of the Milky Way. So it's a very humbling thing to realize that no matter how much knowledge we accumulate in our inquiry to stand against racism, the truth is we will not probably reach a finish line. We're looking at an ongoing journey that should always involve questioning. So <clears throat> this is a resource that Donna shared with me. Um, we are today talking about questioning with courage and when we're talking about questioning regarding the topic of race, the method of Socratic questioning can be very, very helpful. Um, if you've studied rhetoric or if you went to law school, uh, these will be very familiar to you. So for example, if someone says something that you find uh, disturbing, asking questions like, why do you say that? How do you know that? What data is there to support this and why? Um, so there are a whole host of, of examples of questions here. Um, I'm wondering if you could chat me if any one of these uh, seems particularly helpful or relevant to you as you think about uh, responding to an incident that has a racist feel to it for you as you want to try to understand where the person is coming from. Excuse me. So just in the chat box, just 
let us know, okay, we've got one, what does it, what does that mean? Why do you, why do you say that is helpful? What is the other side of the argument? What else should we be considering? Yeah. If that, if it's, if that is true for one X, et cetera, why do you say that? And why now and here? Yeah. These are excellent questions. Um, yeah, keep going. Could you explain further? One of the reasons I love these is that I am one of those people that I am not quick on my feet. I go in the sort of deer in the headlights mode and I try to start explaining. And that's not, not usually the most helpful way to respond. And having these prompts, these questions that we can just you know, copy and paste and use, are, I think are super helpful. What else might I ask? What if you're wrong? Could you explain further? These are all great ones, yeah. And Kitsch, are you assuming add, dot, 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 yeah. What's also important to point out is that much of what we consider to be the foundation of Western logic is also a very Eurocentric way of approaching questions. And so we wanted to point out that, for example, um, point number three, where it says examining evidence and rationale. Um, of course, it's important to look at evidence and rationale, but we also have to understand that much of the data that was quoted over the last 30 years to um, decentralize and disenfranchise communities of color had methodologies that were specifically very racist. So for example, studies questioning the intelligence capacities of uh, and the genetic capacities of people of color. Uh, there's a wonderful book called um, White Logic, White Methodologies. I think I'm quoting it right. And it's from Dr. Tufuku Zuberi, who was actually a, a speaker at CU Boulder this past year. But keep in mind that when it comes to looking at facts and information, we are in the process as a discipline, as an entire academic field of updating the ways in which we set up experiments and the way we look at underrepresented populations and the kind of logic that is set up. So uh, important to note that Socratic methodologies are of course useful. That's why we wanted to include them. We're gonna ask you to dive just a little bit deeper and to expand your method of questioning. So for example, if you're to go underneath the facts, these are the questions that I share with many of my students when they're learning how to do anthropological research in the field of dance. I'll be quiet for a moment and give you an opportunity to read through them. If I may interrupt you, you can get a sense that behind every question, there is also a hidden curriculum or a hidden code that can sometimes drive the question. So for example, um, let's talk about question number six. What are the hidden social forces expressed through the experience? So for example, um, I frequently would have students in a class that a, a dance class that might be focusing on an Africanist tradition. Um, and we're dealing with rhythm and multi layered rhythms and polyrhythmic capacities. Some of the students um, every semester would say, Oh my gosh, I feel so white. And if we were to switch out the elements, and if you were in any other class at the university and a student felt comfortable announcing to everyone in the room, oh my gosh, I feel so black. 
it would raise eyebrows and people would think it would be a very odd declarative statement to present into that kind of a situation. It suddenly makes it all about the person rather than about the learning and it's a deferral from responsibility, right? And so this is where we say, if you're unsure if a question you want to ask maybe has an undercurrent of bias to it or a sense of privilege to it, switch out the elements and try it on with other variables first before you try it out publicly. If you have any questions about this, we're trying to leave much more time at the end of today's production to be able to revisit these questions. So we're gonna briefly move on. Please do feel free to screenshot these questions if you find them useful. The last question mentioned the word intersectionality. So we have not introduced that word yet in our series. And so we wanted to take a pause and give you that information. Intersectionality is a theoretical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities, gender, race, class, sexuality, ability, physical appearance, height, how those things combine and compound to create unique modes of discrimination and privilege. If you look at the illustrative photo on the right side of your screen of two male Barbie dolls, you'll notice that the uh, a European American Barbie doll on the right has uh, sharply angled eyebrows, a very direct gaze, a closed mouth, a uh, head resting very straight on the shoulders, and notice the price of the doll. Yes. Now, in the chat window, will you please tell us what you observe to be different about the African American doll? It's like one of those puzzles you used to do as a child, which of these things is not like the other. The price is lower, mm -hmm. less expensive. Yes, smiling. The head is cocked, teeth showing, surprise look in the eyes, smiling, tilted head, solid shorts, interesting. Eyes and eyebrows wide set, lower price, shorter waist, looking to the side and the head to the side seems slightly frailer to open mouth height, facial expression, less yeah. expensive, gazing in the distance, price in caps, looks like designed to be deferential. Mm -hmm. Yes. Smaller yeah. face, the teeth. Yes. Yep. So I think it's you shared gonna... with me, Donna, that you took this picture in a Walmart. This is not a created <laughs> art piece. Correct. No, this is, this is a factual photo from Walmart. And does this not tell you about the compounding of black identity and male identity so that uh, there's an actual factual devaluation of the black doll and also an infantilizing of the black doll so that he looks more like a puppy dog like a child like a boy unthreatening whereas the male barbie doll on the right is allowed to actually have some swag about him very interesting isn't it and this is where again these identities combine and compound in very complicated ways. Wow. So in looking at the importance of questioning, rather than stick only with Socratic method, we'd like to move towards the importance of diplomacy mm -hmm. as we do in this entire series, because the role of questioning in diplomacy is about keeping open a space of inquiry, keeping the conversation going and not letting it get into hard set um, deflection of responsibility. So you'll notice in the bullets we say, open-ended solicitations yield better information. So avoiding yes, no questions unless you go to the third bullet, you're just trying to confirm for comprehension Otherwise, there can sometimes be bias in a yes, no question. And so open-ended solicitations are about getting more context for what you're learning. Yes, no questions are excellent for confirming and comp uh, comprehension and, by and avoiding bias. It's good to not interrupt, to always be a good listener, to allow silence because sometimes people need an opportunity to gather their thoughts 
as they are constructing their answers with you to examine themselves. Always follow up with, is there more? Would you be willing to please educate me about that? Would you be willing to tell me more? And always approach sensitive information through brief fact-finding questions first, rather than feeling uh, like you can make someone put them in a fishbowl or under a microscope and make them feel vulnerable with an intense question. Sometimes it's good to say, okay, let me get this right. You entered the building and you were walking down the hallway. Yes. Okay. And then as you turned the corner, you encountered someone who said something uncomfortable to you. Is that correct? And just leading up to an, uh, an important moment of disclosure so that someone can know that you are understanding them and seeing them in full before they start putting their heart on their sleeve. Please note that your breathing pattern, the direction of your gaze, the tone of your voice, all play an important part in cultivating a sense of receptivity as a listener. Yeah, and, and this is an area where, uh, you know, I would say that these techniques in listening and questioning are uh, helpful in really whenever there is a difficult topic, you know, or there is a cognitive minefield in that you know that um, we're in an area where our brains tend to create distortions. Um, so let me, you know, sometimes when I talk with folks in the, as an ombuds about diplomatic methods of communication, listening, which, which we did in the last webinar, and today questioning, I get the response of, but that's not fair. You know, I'm the one who's suffering here. Why should I have to go and do all that work? And I just, I just want to acknowledge that it's true. It's not fair. Um, what I do know is that the way in which we approach these difficult conversations has an effect on the outcome. And that doesn't make it fair. These um, suggestions we are sharing regarding diplomacy um, have been shown to be effective. And yes, they are a lot of work. So I'd like you to imagine for a moment a difficult encounter you've had. Let's say it's with someone you know well, a loved one, family member, and really quickly, I'd like you to think about what could you do to make the situation worse? How can you throw gasoline on the fire and have them react to you? So please chat me really quickly, just generally what you could do. Interrupt, yep, assign blame, uh-huh, argue, tell them they're wrong, tell them it's their fault, I can't believe you said that, insult them, you got it. Roll my eyes. Escalate the discussion. Yell. Interrupt. Get louder. Yes. Get angry. Defend and accuse. Exactly. Intuitively, we all know that there are things we can do to make things go downhill pretty quickly. And so what we're suggesting here is that equally, there are techniques that you can employ to make things get better. Now, we can't guarantee outcome because we're talking about human beings. We can never guarantee what the response will be from the other person. But you are more likely, you're changing the odds. The, the, the chance that you have of engaging in a real conversation about the substance of what you want to talk about as opposed to turning people off because of how you do it uh, is greater, right? Um, you know, sometimes I hear from people, well, my cause is just, so it doesn't matter how I say it. Um, there is um, a fairly predictable response that people will have. Um, there is a place and time for kind of protest language. A touch point for me personally in my career is the ACT UP movement uh, when, it, when we were in the middle of the AIDS crisis in the 80s. And their die-in demonstrations really helped direct attention to um, what needed to be done regarding people dying of HIV and AIDS. Um, so 
we just want to get you to think about how you engage when you're talking about difficult topics and, in, and particularly when you're talking about racism because how you engage can have an enormous impact on how things unfold. And so you go into these conversations with your eyes open. If you decide you're wanting to have a protest moment, knowing that it is unlikely to result in the person very carefully listening to you and having a, an open-hearted conversation with them. If that's not your goal, then okay. But if your goal is that, then using um, the, the more diplomatic methods uh, will get you closer to your goal. Okay, so um, Donna, if you could uh, go to the next slide. All right, um, here we're talking about establishing positive intention. So part of this uh, um, topic is actually covered in crucial conversations with the university provides as a training, but letting people know why you are engaging the conversation why is it that you care? What is your purpose in talking with them? Um, what do you hope to accomplish? That can really help the other person not become defensive and to really listen to what you have to say. We are repeating here some prompts that we used in an earlier presentation in terms of how we can initiate uh, a conversation. So, Donna, do you want to sure. um, proceed from here? Yeah, I'll do a little bit of filling in here. You saw this in our first presentation, as Kiersey said, but we wanted to revisit it here because these prompts work. And so when you're at a stalemate moment with someone and you realize there's a conflict arising, especially around race, it's good to establish positive intention. So the prompts that we've shared here, for example, I know we see things differently but I really want to hear what your thoughts are about this. Would you be willing to please educate me on your perspectives and experiences? Just a statement like that alone keeps somebody from saying, how dare you get out of my face, you're racist, right? So what we're trying to do is create a moment of exchange, diplomatic exchange, so that you raise the civility of the moment and help people hit the pause button on the rush of anger that can occur when they start to feel a sense of offense with each other. Um, you've heard us talk about fumbling forward. Um, here's an example of it on the second bullet. I'm going to fumble with what I want to say, but could you please bear with me while I ask you a question? I'm really keen to learn more about this. Um, sometimes in a situation where I don't anticipate I'm gonna get full cooperation with open-hearted communication, I'll use the last bullet on the page. I am not comfortable with what is happening here and talking to you about it is very important to me. For me, that's a full stop saying, I can't proceed any further until we acknowledge what is happening and I would like to make sure we address it and not invisibilize it. I, I wanna point out something that Donna and I are doing is, and uh, I wanna make it more explicit and that is that these techniques work whether you are the person initiating a conversation about racism or whether someone else is initiating a conversation with you. So they go both ways. Mm -hmm. We'd now like to give you an opportunity to practice. So Kiersey, I'm gonna hand the next one to you. Okie doke. As soon as the cursor works. Ah. Uh, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to read this to you as well. Um, Claudia Rankin is an African-American poet um, who has uh, book, The Citizen, um, talks about her experiences of racism in the United States. The new therapist specializes in trauma counseling. You have only ever spoken to her on the phone. Her house has a side gate that leads to a back entrance she uses for patients. You walk down a path bordered on both sides with deer grass and rosemary to the gate, which turns out to be locked. 
At the front door, the bell is a small round disc that you press firmly. When the door finally opens, the woman standing there yells at the top of her lungs, get away from my house. What are you doing in my yard? It's as if a wounded Doberman pincher or German shepherd has gained the power of speech. And though you back up a few steps, you manage to tell her you have an appointment. You have an appointment? She spits back. Then she pauses. Everything pauses. Oh, she says, followed by, oh, yes, that's right. I am sorry. I am so sorry. So, so sorry. So if you think about um, the conversational techniques we were using here, we would like you to chat to us what you might say in this situation. Now, Donna, I know you're having trouble with the Zoom platform. Is there any way that we could go back, you know, and have people take a peek at, uh, you know, the slide on diplomacy and questioning, establishing positive attention, and then the Socratic question so that you can have a little bit of a jog your memory experience. What would you say if you were the woman in the poem confronting a new therapist who responded to, you, to your presence in such a racist way? I would want to turn around and walk away. Yeah, me too. I would not want to give this person my money, my time, or share any experiences with this person. Starting by allowing silence seems like the first and best response for her sake and mine. I might ask what or who did you see when you opened your door? I would also politely decline her therapy services. Yes. I would likely leave because I wouldn't trust her to understand me or my experiences. Yeah. As a white woman, I don't want to presume I know more than I do. And Donna's description of the full stop response seems wise here. Mm -hmm. Trust would be broken and I would not feel comfortable continuing the session or entering her home. Yeah. This um, particular experience, oh, another one. Can you explain to me what just happened and why? Yeah, that's a great question. This particular experience um, is one that we, this type of experience is one that Don and I talked about previously where we are saying it's, you don't have to forgive and there are places where forgiveness isn't really appropriate. Um, and the truth is, in that moment, you can decide how you want to respond. It's perfectly okay to walk away. It's perfectly okay to do those things. And if you're curious, you know, you might respond this, why did you, why did you say that? You know, why did you treat me this way? I like, Krista, uh, you said, can you explain to me what just happened and why? <laughs> Excellent question. You know, it is a way of, of not absolving um, the therapist of the racist behavior, but making them do the work of figuring out what just happened, what they need to do differently. Yes. Absolutely. Great, excellent chats. Uh, I really appreciate your thoughts, folks. Thank you. I would also like to extend the thought experiment on this by asking you to think about what it is like for people of color who don't have the, the uh, choice of being able to disengage. For example, perhaps I need medicine for my child from a doctor who is rude to me and feeling like 
I have to swallow the insults, ignore the hostilities because my child is more important to me than the knucklehead that I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. And this is what uh, citizens of color have dealt with for 400 years in this country. At times, not having the luxury of being able to disengage, but having to stay with and swallow ongoing insults and hostility and rudeness. And this helps you to put yourself in someone else's shoes and consider deeper strategies rather than just saying, I'm done. <laughs> I agree with you. I would definitely want to say, mm -mm, no, 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 we're not doing business. However, what if you don't have the choice? Mm -hmm. You know, I was uh, really moved by um, an extensive statement that Neil deGrasse Tyson made um, in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And he says he doesn't like to talk about racism. And, but to give people an idea of the magnitude. So this is, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is a celebrity. He is a very well-known astrophysicist and he's on the media all the time. And even for someone like him with his level of prominence, he says he deals with racist comments and incidents about one to five times a week. So we're talking about a constant barrage. Um, research shows that African-American teenagers deal with many more incidents than that. It's something like five to 10 a day. Um, that's, that is hard to bear up under. So, dealt with that yes, go ahead, Donna. No, I was just gonna say, I certainly dealt with that as a teenager um, from my teachers. Absolutely. Um, if it is possible to proceed, if you choose to stay, and you realize that you and the party you're dealing with are at an impasse, mediation, of course, is an option. So we wanted to mention the kind of services you have available to you on the CU campus and in the community. Here, see, may I hand this one to you? Yes. Um, so in the Ombuds Office, we provide mediation services. Um, if you are having a difficult discussion about, um, you know, an incident um, that you would like to work through with a colleague, we can help with that. Um, most of the time you will find that those incidents will have been reported to the Office of Institutional Equity and Compliance for investigation. Um, many of the kinds of incidents that Donna and I are referencing in this presentation um, do not rise to the level that they would be uh, running afoul of the federal statutes that, um, you know, guide, guide um, Title VII. And so one, um, most of the time there will not be an investigation is what I'm saying. And then there is an option of engaging with our office. And we do um, help people communicate and come to grips with what has happened interpersonally. Please note that everything, all services that we provide in the Ombuds Office are voluntary. And so, you know, either party can say, I don't want to participate, but we often have situations where people want to get through something difficult and, and really get to the other side of that. Um, if uh, you're dealing with a situation that is not about involving, you know, CU Boulder, uh, there are also community mediation centers throughout the United States and they offer low cost mediation um, and they often deal with neighbor issues, public concerns like the use of a park, interpersonal difficulties, and um, they can offer assistance. Now, I do need to say though, that in most places in the United States where you can get mediation services, 
the methodologies that are used are not, not necessarily sensitive to social justice issues, differential power issues, et cetera. So you, you would want to inquire very carefully if you wanting a mediation around uh, racism because um, sometimes mediation uh, reinforces the status quo. Okay. That's correct, Kiersey. And there are, for example, updates that are being in, uh, brought into mediation practices that, for example, will look at all parties in the room and then assuming that there may be some social disenfranchisement for one of the parties if they are black, female, something like that, they will say, okay, this person will have voice first. So their voice will be primary as we go into this. Um, and if someone feels wrong, they'll be like, hey, wait a minute, I made the complaint, why can't I speak first? And it's like, well, it's because we are acknowledging that there is some social bias potentially in this situation, right? So investigate practitioners and uh, interview them before you engage services. But if you do want to use the Boulder Ombuds Office, which is doing a fantastic job, we wanted to make sure you have a phone number versus an email because your email uh, is not necessarily private. We wanted you to know that your initial inquiry is private through phone. Thanks for the plug, Donna. My pleasure. So if mediation doesn't work, right? Or if that's not an option and you're dealing with someone who is really acting as a censor of your expression or a gatekeeper to something that you need, for example, um, professors acting as gatekeepers for students or administrators acting as gatekeepers for faculty members who are trying to get tenure. We wanted to really address the issue about when other parties suppress questioning, they're abrasive, they're uncooperative, rigid, abusive, uncaring, apathetic, and they may possess very strong blind spots. We all know they're out there. We do want to encourage you to think about the need to possibly winding down that encounter and leaving immediately. If you choose to stay, you can request a witness in the environment. For example, have you ever been in a fender bender and someone on site says, would you be willing to serve as a witness? It's the same thing if you're in an encounter that is going south and you're like, I will not meet with you unless there's a third party in the room or I request a witness right now to watch this unfolding. Um, always observe for details because you want to be able to recount the details if you do choose to report and pursue action. We recommend uh, attending to your body. Place your feet equidistant on the ground and take a deep breath. You can always also stay silent. Now, we say that with a wink because you're actually giving them a chance to act out and not join the tantrum but we don't necessarily feel that silence is always your best option. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, but don't let them drag you into a tantrum. If you do weather an encounter like that, it's very important to make sure that you give yourself a sense of sanctuary afterwards. You activate self-care so that you can really be proactive about fortifying, nourishing, rebalancing, and calming yourself. And so we put together a list of things that people shared with us um, have helped them. And I'll give you an opportunity just to take a peek at that list. And I'd like to say that this is true whether someone is coming to you and saying you did something that was a racist act or whether you are the target of a racist act. Because, um, and I'm a little bit of a brain science geek, but it shakes things up. We are not able to think as clearly as we would normally think. And these practices allow you to cut to a place of greater calm and re-engage uh, certain parts of your brain that kind of go offline when you go upset. It's the prefrontal cor cortex that um, is no longer in control of things. And, you know, if you're the target of a racist act, 
It allows you to get back into center with yourself. If you're the person who is being asked to consider your racist behavior, it allows you to get centered again so that you can more calmly examine the information that's being given to you and be more thoughtful about it. Um, this would be engaging in system two thinking according to Daniel Kahneman. I have a whole nother webinar on that, but it allows you to get to a place where you can really listen to the content. Being mindful of our time, we're going to move forward with sharing with you two very brief videos. The first one, I hope you have your sense of humor with you today. This is actually from a comedy team about silence not being an option. Being sensitive to white fragility is difficult, which is why we've devised a simple system to help you foster a non-hostile work environment for your white employees and coworkers. Stop, ignore, listen, empathize, never complain, and eat. Or as we like to call it, the silence system. Here, let's watch what happens when silence is put into action. So I'm not racist. Stop. Like, I voted for Obama. Ignore. Like, I understand the reason for the Black Lives Matter movement. Listen. But it's just like, all lives do matter. Empathize. I just feel like race really isn't relevant in America anymore. Never complain. You're really easy to talk to, Adrian. And eat. That's right. Excellent. Adrian was able to diffuse a potentially hostile work situation by using silence. Great work, Adrian. America is a beautiful country built on some ugly things. Things that just don't belong in the workplace. And in order to remain productive, we must all pitch in to protect our most powerful and most fragile. Because when silence works, everyone works. So let's all be sensitive. White sensitive. Are you still with us? <laughs> so we're going to give you an opportunity to try and fumble forward on your own. Here is a video from the makers of um, Crucial Conversations. And with apologies, that video is apparently not wanting to work right now. So what we would do is invite you to screenshot down at the bottom of the screen the link so that you could go have a look at it because it gives some beautiful prompts on how to start a conversation about race with stating clear intentions. Some of those tips we've already gone over. So this was just going to be a reinforcement of them. But in the interest of time, since the video is acting up, we will bounce forward. Oh, here we go. Often the conversations that we feel to be difficult tend to be those where we are misunderstood or where we may fundamentally disagree. Racism and inequality are often those conversations we avoid and even are encouraged to avoid in more public settings like work because of the likelihood that they may divulge into some unhealthy dialogue for those very reasons. The funny thing is when these conversations do go well, they can be life-changing. If you don't believe me, Research Daryl Davis and his amazing quest to answer the question, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? So what can we do to make these conversations have a higher likelihood of success? Lead with your intentions. Many friends and I have recently discussed how to make conversations on race and inequality go well from the onset. The idea is always the same. Lead with your intentions and make them clear. Starting off with something like, I am not trying to make things any more uncomfortable than they need to be or say anything that would be offensive. I just want to have a better understanding of a view different from my own and I would love to gain that insight from you. Or even, I have never approached a conversation like this before and I know that things may not come out correctly, which is not my goal. My goal is that we talk about our experiences with racism in this country and learn ways to better support each other and others now and especially in the future. Would that be okay with you? With our intent clear from the get-go and consistent throughout the dialogue, we can reach a place of safety and move into openly learning and sharing our experience and solutions with each other. Thanks for watching. 
Visit vitalsmarts.com slash say that to access more tips and training on how to speak up when it matters most. So we've got a couple of microaggressions here that we have encountered in our own work. We would like for you to think about what questions you could fashion as a first response. So feel free to dig in with the chat. I received this personally. You're from Louisiana? Ooh, we, I sure do love Cajun food. And Kiersey, you can let me know if the chat window yields anything interesting. I'm happy to. Um, I guess uh, what I'd like to prompt you to think about is what's wrong with this picture? Yep. We're not getting anything yet, so um, maybe we need to explain a bit. Yes, in Louisiana, there is a difference between Creoles and Cajuns. Cajuns are the Scandinavian descendants of settlers in Louisiana territory. Creoles are citizens who have slave ancestry. So when we're called Cajuns, we think, well, who do you think was actually in the kitchens of the Cajuns cooking their food? It was the slaves we created what is known as Louisiana food. And so when people accredit Cajuns with creating the food, we think, hmm, unfortunate that you don't know that it was actually Africans and African descended peoples that created the Creole cuisine that would eventually become Cajun food. So we do have an excellent question here that's being proposed. Tell me, what do you know about Louisiana? That's <laughs> a great place to start, yes. Um, you know, um, next one. I'm curious, how would it have felt if the statement was about Creole food? Okay, I think you just answered that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. should we do another one? Yes. All right, I'll take this. Kirk, Kirsty, Kirsty. Can we just call you Chris? Your name is too hard to pronounce. What's wrong with this picture? What would you ask? Oh, I'm happy to teach you to say how to say my name. It means so much to me when people use it. Would you like to know how to pronounce my name? Nice. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very good. Here's another yeah. prompt for all of you. Do you want me to read this one? Go for it, Kiersey. Okay. Oh, you speak another language at home? Then we need to put your kids in remedial English spoken to a native English speaker who was not white. What process do you actually have in place to ascertain language proficiency? Interesting question. What would make you say that? Can you explain what the requirements are for being placed in that class? Why do you think that my children, un children are unable to speak English? Yeah. Excellent. Kirsten, we might be preaching to the choir. These questions are excellent. <laughs> I get this one all yep. the time. Wow, how come your hair is like that? Black hair is so cool. Do you wash it? Do you think I do not wash my hair? <laughs> I can see you're curious about my hair, but I'm going to leave it to you to learn how it's different from yours. Ooh. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Great ones. I'm wondering why this is so important to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I always forget that this is a question to ask in the moment. Why do you want to know anyway? Yeah. I appreciate your interest, but today we are here to talk about X, Y, Z. Oh yeah. Very good, very good. I've also just sometimes returned the question, well, how do you wash your hair? 
I might uh, stare and shake my head for a moment. How is this relevant? Do you wash yours? Yep, someone had the same response. Good, good. I know it's not your intention, but those questions make me feel uncomfortable. May we talk about why? Nice. No. You are on this. Woo! Why is that important to you? What exactly is cool about black hair? <laughs> <laughs> all right, you're ready for your next prompt? You all are getting A pluses, so let's see if we can move you along. You want me to do this one? Sure. You know that little Jamal is so smart. And he's so clean and well behaved too. Kiersey, just what offer. makes you say that? Mm -hmm. Why do you sound surprised that my child is smart, clean, and well-behaved? Why do you seem so surprised? Does that surprise you? Yeah. You, are you always surprised when a child is smart, clean, and well-behaved? <laughs> How do you, would you expect him to be? Can you tell me why you chose those particular comments about my child? And then finally, of course he is. <laughs> yeah, these are great. You, you all are doing so great with this. Last one. You know, I feel safe talking to you. You're safe and friendly. I mean, you're not even really that black. What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Great. It hurts me when you don't see me as black. I'm proud to be black. What makes you say that? Can you define that black for me? Can you share some more of what you mean? What do you mean by really black? Excellent. Well done, everyone. Thank you. And then I'm not feeling very safe talking to you right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and someone just said, I can't with these. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Uh, these are the kind of things that have happened to us on more than one occasion or reported to us on more than one occasion. Yeah. Let me have a, I have a couple more responses. Oh, oh. I'm glad you feel safe. Your comment makes me feel that you aren't recognizing who I am. That's very sophisticated. You mm -hmm. might feel safe, but I do not. Nice. Yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted you, Donna. I, I just wanted you to hear those. I know you can't see them. Um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much. I um, wanted to make sure we have at least a few minutes for some open questioning. And in the interest of furthering your education, we've always put up resources. Next week, we're going to get a little deeper into those resources. And for example, these are some of the books that we're going to be talking about. Wanted to give you an opportunity to screenshot and possibly think about adding one choice out of these to your library and making it something that you tackle within the next few weeks. Yeah, these are excellent. And I, I do want to make one comment about those examples that you um, were practicing on. These are things that are not rare. Uh, Don and I uh, shared our experiences and came up with this list of things that are incredibly common. And as you can tell, I mean, I can tell from your reactions, um, upsetting, yeah. So next Wednesday, we'll be going deeper into these kinds of resources so that the kind of questions and guidance that we've offered you in this series, you can also learn on your own with some of these wonderful things because you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you don't have to start from scratch anti-racism efforts are not new. So all, all you have to do is pull a seat up to the table and join a conversation that is already in motion. So we'll help to connect you with some of those resources next week. Do you have any questions you'd like to share? I will stop sharing my screen so that I can join you. Someone just saying they need to jump for 1 p.m. Totally get it. Um, 
Okay. Any questions? Donna and I will hang out for a bit if you have any burning questions. We're getting lots of thank yous, Donna, um, but not, not any questions so far. Okay, yes, I was able to now open up my chat window now that I'm not okay. sharing slides. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your week if you need to jump off. We appreciate you. And also thank you to Carrie and Liz. As always, the wind underneath the wings of this whole thing happening. Absolutely. Really run smoothly, so thank you so much, Liz and Carrie. Gratitude, right back at you, y'all. Right yeah, back. Yeah, we're you. so pleased that you're joining us. Impressive. I'm going to save this chat and post it up in the corner of my bedroom so that when I wake up in the morning, I can see intelligent questions and lots of positive reinforcement for the work. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and with there are no further questions, we want to thank you for all of the love. Oh, wait a minute. Looks like there is a question. We need okay. to practice breathing. I have a difficult time not just reacting. Any tips? Yes, Kurt, to hit the pause button. It is good. Uh, we've talked about in some of our previous uh, webinars to talk to tackle the exhalation to hit the pause button, just to try to extend the exhalation of your breathing cycle. Naturally draw in the next breath. Give yourself a chance to think and allow images to arise in your mind. Allow metaphors and associations to reveal themselves. And you can actually say to someone, I'm going to take a quick pause so that I can respond to you. And I, I just want to say, Kurt, our, our second webinar um, was meeting the moment. Um, if you go to the Ombuds Office web, web page uh, and click on the Lunch and Learn link or the Standing Against Racism link, you can find that second in the series. And if you click on the card, it will take you to a recording uh, because we uh, spent some time covering exactly that. It's very difficult to feel like you're standing on your feet when something gets thrown your way. Oh, thank you. Liz just put the link to our uh, Lunch and Learn page. Great question, Kurt, and thank you, Liz, for providing that resource. And with that, I think we have to probably set you free for the rest of your day. Kiersey, always wonderful working with you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. We'll see you all next Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye.